Well, hello and welcome to another episode of In Conversation with Benedict Rogers, a, an interview series produced by Hong Kong Watch. And this is the uh, only the second episode um, this year, both in 2023 and in the Year of the Rabbit, which uh, we have just celebrated as the uh, Lunar New Year. So let me say to everybody uh, watching this, uh, Gong Hei Fat Choi, and it's uh, a great pleasure and privilege to uh, welcome as our guest uh, today, uh, Jenny Kwan. Um, Jenny is the uh, Member of Parliament for uh, Vancouver East uh, and has served in the Canadian Parliament since 2015. Uh, and before being elected to uh, the Parliament in, in Ottawa, uh, she served in the Legislative Assembly of uh, British Columbia, uh, was a Provincial Cabinet Minister, and began her political career when she was elected as the youngest uh, member, I believe, of the Vancouver City Council uh, at the age of 26. Um, she's a member of the New, Democrat, New Democratic Party in Canada, um, but was born in Hong Kong and came to Canada with her family uh, at the age of just uh, nine years old. And uh, Jenny has been a wonderful friend both to Hong Kong itself uh, and to Hong Kong Watch. So Jenny Kwan, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Benedict. And of course, Happy Lunar New Year to everyone and wishing them good health, prosperity uh, in the Year of the Rabbit. Thank you very much. Let me start by asking, as I just said in that introduction, you um, were born in Hong Kong, you uh, left at the age of uh, nine. What are your memories of your childhood in Hong Kong and your reflections on how Hong Kong has changed uh, since then? Well, um, thinking back, uh, you know, as a little girl in Hong Kong, um, I thought it was a wonderful city. It was a city that is full of life uh, and, you know, was always so exciting uh, when my mom brought us down to the market for her to do the shopping and just to sort of seeing people uh, there, uh, you know, in, in that sort of busyness uh, of life. Uh, and so that was my memory of Hong Kong, of course, going out with my dad to have dim sum and, you know, and all of those kinds of things. But of course, things have changed a lot in Hong Kong. Over the years, uh, I've visited uh, and went back to uh, Hong Kong and just really saw the uh, changes, uh, the expansion uh, of Hong Kong. But the latest round of changes uh, is what really breaks my heart. Uh, we see with the national security law uh, what it is doing to Hong Kong and Hong Kongers. Uh, and as someone who was born in Hong Kong, who uh, have deep memories and connections to Hong Kong uh, and the breaking of the uh, the agreement, the Sino agreement, the one country, two system uh, rule uh, and the really aggressive approach that the Chinese government has taken uh, with Hong Kong and the people who have been protesting, uh, raising their voice, bringing forward their concerns, uh, really de demanding for the rights to be respected, to be treated this way and to be persecuted in this way. It absolutely just breaks my heart. Mm, absolutely. You quite rightly talked about the national security law. Um, and that uh, was was clearly a major turning point when it was imposed uh, on Hong Kong in 2020. Um, but uh, what would you say were um, some of the earlier turning points leading up to uh, that that point? And do you think that the early signs of the erosion of Hong Kong's freedoms uh, and autonomy should have been spotted uh, earlier? Uh, could the international community have done more to prevent things getting to the the point they're at now? There were certainly signs, um, you know, early on uh, with the protests, with people taking to the streets in a peaceful way in protesting and the aggressive response that the police had dealt with the protesters. You know, there were these signs that all the way through uh, and then to the point where it kind of just got out of control. Uh, I think the missed uh, opportunity, of course, rests with the Hong Kong government uh, in their approach in handling it. You know, when you promise to say that is one country, two systems, that you respect uh, the basic laws within Hong Kong, you really need to do that. But they didn't. And their reaction to the protests were aggressive, were violent, uh, you know, to the student protests. Uh, and, and some of the, you know, it pushed people to the 
brink, really, uh, and enforce the, the various actions, interactions in that way. Um, and of course, the international community, um, you know, were watching this as it unfolded, and people were mostly silent about it. I remember in Canada here, I was the first uh, politician to speak at this event, uh, the rally that was held. And basically saying and calling on the Hong Kong government to respect the rule of law, to respect the basic law, uh, and to stop the violence. Because, you know, peaceful protests should be honored and respected. Uh, and uh, and I was the first politician to do that. So it, it was kind of crickets prior to, to, to that. And now it's escalated to this point where most definitely the situation in Hong Kong, the imposition of the national security law has gotten the attention of the international community. Mm, absolutely. Um, alongside the United Kingdom, which has its um, BNO scheme, uh, Canada uh, has the largest population of, of Hong Kongers, uh, I believe, outside uh, Hong Kong and has a, a very welcome uh, lifeboat scheme. Could you maybe summarize um, uh, the details of, of Canada's current uh, lifeboat scheme? Uh, and do you think that Canada has done enough or is there more that it could and should do to give Hong Kongers a, a lifeline out of Hong Kong should they need it? Well, primarily, uh, the Canadian government offer a uh, economic stream for Hong Kongers, uh, the open work permit stream, primarily uh, as the key focal point in offering this lifeboat to Hong Kongers. But in my estimation, this stream is uh, hugely problematic. Right from the get-go, when the government announced this, uh, you know, uh, advocates in the community, myself, had pointed out to the government and to the minister to say that there are too many barriers within the stream. For example, the requirement that you graduate five years within the five years before the application makes it not feasible for the vast majority majority of the people, because a lot of people had graduated prior to those five years. There are, of course, um, you know, younger students as well, people who are in high school, for example, who are engaged in the pro-democracy protests, they will have no ability to access these programs. And so um, for me, this was hugely problematic. It was brought to the government's attention. However, they didn't do anything to fix that. I would also say that you know, this is a initiative to support Hong Kongers. So it should not be viewed from just the perspective of what's the benefit to Canada's economy and our well-being and our interests. It should also ensure that there is the humanitarian component to it. And really, there was no humanitarian measures to support the people of Hong Kong. On family reunification, I was particularly disappointed with that. Really, the government just referred people to the normal streams that are already existing. So there's no really unique or special uh, initiatives related to that. One thing that I thought the government could do and still should do is to open up the family reunification stream because we have, uh, there are so many people with relations that are here in Canada, they may well be extended family members and not necessarily, you know, your spouse or dep dependents. And so if we open up sponsorship for extended family members, we would be able to bring more home Hong Kong is here to Canada to safety, and they have the advantage of knowing someone already here, family members already here. And as a case in point, in fact, when my family immigrated here to Canada back in 1976, uh, we were sponsored by my aunt. We came from the family reunification stream that existed for extended family members. That's how we came. We should actually be bringing those kinds of family reunification measures back to Canada. At the end of the day, it, it, it kind of comes down to this. We saw how Canada offer a variety of um, very extensive immigration measures to support the people in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and what... I think the Canadian government should do is offer the same kind of treatment to the people of Hong Kong. Absolutely. Um, can I turn uh, to the question of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, activities, not only at home and dismantling Hong Kong's freedoms, um, but around the world, uh, infiltration, influence, uh, intimidation, transnational repression. Um, there are reports uh, about secret uh, Chinese police stations in Canada and in other countries uh, as well. 
um, allegations in Canada of uh, 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 financial uh, support for, for political candidates. Uh, and of course, the um, the encounter that uh, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau had with Xi Jinping uh, just a few months ago. Um, I, I wonder what your views on this are, particularly representing Vancouver, where I think this is um, uh, quite an issue. Um, and is Canada taking this seriously enough? Well, um, I think that the situation is cause for alarm. You know, what we're seeing, of course, uh, I think are attempts to undermine our democracy, undermine our system here in Canada, one that we cherish, although to some degree, I think perhaps some Canadians, we may even take it for granted because we've always had it. So what we really need to do, of course, is to protect it and fiercely protect it. Uh, and so with foreign interference, the allegations uh, of, uh, in fact, it was pointed out that they were uh, uh, influencing uh, attempts to influence candidates uh, with uh, donations uh, during uh, the last couple of elections. The prime minister apparently uh, was informed of this. Then later on, he said, well, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, it was kind of um, questionable, really, uh, that some months later, then he said he didn't know anything of it. What we really need to do, of course, is to get to the bottom of it. We need to ensure that this is not taking place. Uh, and it doesn't matter what government uh, or what country is trying to influence uh, and impact our democratic system, whether it be uh, China, whether it be Russia or any other country for that matter. That's something that we should actually take very seriously. And we need to uh, investigate it uh, and put a stop to it. The other thing, of course, with the offices, uh, the infiltration with offices, with the police, uh, and so on, that too is cause for alarm. So we need to get to the bottom of all of this uh, to protect Canada and to protect our interests, and also to send a clear message that we will not be played. Canada is not going to be sort of sitting back and allowing for this ha to happen uh, and, and, and turn a blind eye to it. We cannot afford to do so. Our democracy matters to us too much. It mm. is who we are, and it defines our country in that way. And we have to do everything we can to protect it. Mm. Absolutely. And of course, these are issues, uh, although they're probably particularly prevalent in Canada, they're, they're issues that many democracies around the world are are facing, including the, the, the UK. Um, I, I'd like to Sorry, we, did you want to make an uh, extra comment on, so, on sorry, that? Sorry, I was just going to say, hey, I mean, there, there's an element to which uh, Canada should be working with our ally countries, right? Because we're in it together. Uh, mm. And our ally countries who are faced with the same sort of uh, tactics uh, uh, and, and, and attacks to their democracy, we should be working together mm. in unison. Uh, and, and and to address this issue. And of course, some of these issues, I think, also uh, need to be brought up to the UN as well, so that we can bring the larger international community together and to say, what do we need to do to address uh, these threats uh, to our democracy? Absolutely agree. I, I always say that uh, uh, democracies should form a united front to counter the Chinese uh, regime's united front. Um, I'd like to turn to the question of um, uh, pension funds and, and ethical uh, investments. Um, uh, as I, I believe you know, uh, Hong Kong Watch has published now three issues, uh, uh, three reports on, on this issue um, and has documented many pension funds around the world, including uh, several in, in Canada, um, the, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, Canada's Civil Service Superannuation Fund, um, and provincial uh, pension funds from, from around uh, Canada, including British Columbia, uh, that have um, investments in Chinese companies that may be complicit with uh, the genocide of the Uyghurs, the surveillance state. Um, what do you think uh, should be done about this in, in Canada? Well, one of the things that um, my colleague uh, um, Alistair McGregor actually tried to do was to put forward a private member's bill that really ensures us is ethical investments for pension funds. Uh, because I think that's really important uh, to ensure that 
you know, uh, the dollars that are invested uh, is done in such a way that does not do harm, uh, human rights violations and, and harm uh, to other communities. So we, we need to ensure what we say, what we preach is actually reflected in our actions uh, in that way. I wonder also too, that with the investments in the pension funds, how many of the members are even aware of the situation? I suspect that some people may not be aware of it. And if they were, perhaps Perhaps uh, they would call for change. And so uh, so there are a number of ways to, I think, address this issue. One is, of course, put in legislation uh, around ethical investments. The other piece uh, is uh, show by leadership by the Canadian government as well to show that leadership of what needs to do to be done uh, and to take action. And then, of course, educating the public. The public really needs to know what is going on so that they are aware and uh, as I say, I think a lot of people, if they knew that their pension funds were invested uh, in in initiatives uh, that is a uh, outright violation of people's human rights, that they would not actually want their investments uh, there. Mm, absolutely. Um, turning to a, a, another issue, um, which is one that has uh, risen particularly in, in recent years, we, we have seen an increase uh, around uh, the Western world in anti-Chinese, anti-East uh, Asian uh, racism, gen genuine racism. And that is, of course, uh, extremely concerning. Um, but at the same time, the Chinese Communist Party uh, likes to put out the narrative that if you criticize its conduct, you're anti-China, anti-Chinese, and therefore racist. How do we tackle genuine racism and hate crimes uh, against people of Chinese or, or East Asian uh, heritage? while at the same time continuing to speak out against the uh, regime in China and its uh, repression and aggression? Well, I think that we need to make sure and the and people need to make sure that they make this di distinction. The Chinese government are not the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. I am a Chinese Canadian. And for me to criticize the national security law and the human rights violations of the Chinese government does not mean to say that I am dis I am discriminating against Chinese people. I am not. In fact, I think quite the opposite. What we're fighting for is for uh, equal treatment, uh, for dignity, and for respect, for us to be treated like we want others to treat ourselves. So no matter which government it is that's doing these human rights violations, we need to speak up. Likewise, it's the same argument. You can't say that when we speak against the Holocaust, that we're against Germans. We're not, we're against the regime at that time and the atrocities that were inflicted uh, on the Jewish people. We're not against Germans or German Canadians for that matter, but we were definitely against a regime and we condemn that regime. And so we have to make that distinction. I know that the Chinese authorities want to conflate this uh, and create this sort of murkiness to say that when you criticize the government, the Chinese government, then you're therefore criticizing Chinese people. That is absolutely not the case. And I completely reject that. On the issue around discrimination, racism, hate crimes against uh, Asian, East Asian people, in fact, uh, all peoples where this is happening, indigenous peoples, people from the LGBTQ2 plus community uh, and so on, we need to condemn that action. That hate stems from somewhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's where we got to tackle and we need to distinguish that and see it clearly. Because if we don't, then we're just saying, oh, it's okay. For, uh, a, a, for a government to uh, uh, have these crimes against humanities take place. And then we can turn a blind eye. And if we criticize them, goodness, then we're actually criticizing its people is wrong. It's mm -hmm. not the people who's making these decisions, it's the government. And who we're criticizing is the government. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I, I always uh, say as often as I can that uh, I'm not anti-China. In fact, I'm very pro-China having lived both in mainland, mainland China and in Hong Kong, I many Chinese friends, I lo love China. And, and it's because I love China and Hong Kong that I speak out for uh, for their freedom. And it's the Chinese Communist Party we need to be focused on. So um, so thank you for, for, for those comments. Um, I'd like to come to a penultimate uh, question um, before we, we come towards the end of this interview. Um, what more do you think that Canada uh, 
And we've touched on this a little bit already, but what, what more do you think Canada, alongside the UK, the US uh, and others, could do to hold Beijing to account for uh, breaking the Sino-British Joint Declaration? Do you think that uh, targeted sanctions are a possibility? Uh, is there more that could be done at the United Nations, which you mentioned earlier? Um, and yeah, what what more pressure can we put on Beijing or at least consequences uh, for the regime for what they've done to Hong Kong? Well, for sure, I think that we should be looking at sanctions. Uh, Canada, we do have the Magnitsky Act uh, and we need to apply it uh, and apply it to um, people who are engaging in these human rights violations uh, in China, in Hong Kong. Uh, and there has to be consequences in a real way so that uh, so that people will come to realize that Canada mean what we say. When we say we stand with the people of Hong Kong, it means that aside from uh, providing a lifeboat, which, by the way, the lifeboat scheme that the Canadian government had introduced is going to expire uh, in, in early February. So we need to actually extend uh, that stream and also expand the stream. But beyond that, we have to have consequences for the violators uh, and to let them know that we mean business. And so imposing the Magnitsky Act sanctions is something that Canada can do. And when we impose it, I also need to say we need to follow up to enforce it as well, not just say we're going to put in these sanctions and then basically not enforce it, because then that too is meaningless. Um, I think that, yes, we should bring the issues uh, on, on, on the human rights violations uh, with, with China. Uh, to the international community at the UN. There are a whole variety of measures that can be taken there. Uh, and so working with our allies, we should be thinking about what do we need to do collectively to address this is in the interest of all global communities who believe in democracy, who believe in freedoms, who are against human rights violations and atrocities. So, um, so when we do that, we strengthen ourselves. You know, there is strength in numbers, uh, and I think it matters. Uh, and then there's also an educational component to it as well. We need to educate the public. You know, as you say, this is not a target against China, but it's the regime and their oppressive approach uh, in how is treating its people. On the Uyghur issue, you know, there's outright denial that there's even a genocide. Oh my goodness, right? Uh, and so we need to um, punch through all of that and say, this is the reality. And we have to face the music because at the end of the day, it's about humanity, it's about people, it's about lives, and we're all connected and we need to stand together. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, I certainly hope that Canada will um, uh, extend and expand, as you've said, uh, its uh, lifeboat scheme. Um, and it's also worth noting just for listeners that in uh, a year from now, January 2024, China has its uh, universal periodic review at the United Nations, and we'll certainly be working hard uh, throughout this year to make sure that as many member states as possible uh, include Hong Kong in, in their recommendations. And I hope Canada uh, will, will be one of those member states uh, that does that. Um, a final question uh, as we conclude this, this conversation. Um, we've just celebrated, as we said at the beginning, the Lunar New Year. We've begun the the year of the rabbit. What message would you like to give to listeners, um, especially those who are still in Hong Kong and Hong Kongers in the diaspora around the world about the future for Hong Kong? Well, I think simply to say this, a message of hope and to let them know that the international community, we're watching and watching very carefully. Uh, we stand with them and we will do everything we can to support them, including from the light full screen, but also advancing democracy and human rights around the globe. And that includes Hong Kong as well. And so we will be looking to work with the international community here from Canada to see how we can advance that agenda collectively. So don't lose hope. Uh, stay strong, and uh, we stand with you. We know you, we see you, we hear you, and we will fight with you. That's a wonderful message on, on which uh, to end this conversation. Um, Jenny Kwan, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thanks for having me.